Introduction to Developmental Psychology Developmental psychology, a field as fascinating as it is complex, intricately weaves scientific, applied, and interdisciplinary approaches to understand how and why humans change over the course of their lives. It's a bit like being a detective, but instead of solving crimes, we're unraveling the mysteries of human growth and development. The Historical Tapestry of Developmental Psychology Imagine developmental psychology as a rich tapestry woven with threads from various historical and theoretical backgrounds. Initially, it was all about observing physical growth and behavior changes, but soon this expanded to include mental, emotional, and social development. The field has roots in philosophy and biology, and over time, it has borrowed concepts from fields as diverse as sociology, anthropology, and neuroscience. It's a bit like a melting pot of ideas, simmering together to create a comprehensive understanding of human development. Conducting research, the Sherlock Holmes way, just like Sherlock Holmes uses various methods to solve mysteries, developmental psychologists have a toolkit of research methods. One popular approach is the structured interview, where researchers play the role of an interviewer, asking each participant the same set of questions in the same manner. It's not about yes-no or true-false questions, but rather about probing deeper into the human psyche in a consistent way. When it comes to assigning participants to treatment conditions, developmental psychologists often rely on random assignment. This is like shuffling a deck of cards to ensure each hand is as unpredictable as the next. By doing this, researchers can be more confident that any differences observed are due to the treatment and not some other very ethical considerations, a tightrope walk. Conducting developmental research is a bit like walking a tightrope. You have to balance scientific inquiry with ethical responsibility. Researchers must obtain informed consent, ensure confidentiality, and avoid causing harm. They must also be particularly sensitive when working with children, who are not just miniature adults, but individuals with their own rights and needs. Behaviorism and social learning theory a double-edged sword. Now let's dive into the intriguing worlds of behaviorism and social learning theory. Think of behaviorism as the no-nonsense, straight-to-the-point approach to psychology. It's all about stimuli and responses. You see a cookie, you eat it, you touch a hot stove, you learn to avoid it. Behaviorism uses techniques like classical and operant conditioning to shape behavior. On the other side, we have social learning theory, where imitation is the name of the game. It's not just about what you're directly taught, but also what you pick up from observing others. The latest twist in this plot is the role of cognition. It's not just imitation, but understanding the thoughts behind the actions. Both these theories have been tremendously useful, especially in behavior modification. Think of it as a psychological toolkit for fixing a range of issues, from nail biting to more severe behavioral challenges. However, no theory is perfect. Critics argue that both behaviorism and social learning theory might be a bit too narrow. They're like looking through a keyhole. You see part of the picture, but you're missing out on the broader landscape of environmental influences. Plus, there's the argument that these theories don't give enough credit to people's ability to shape their own development. After all, we're not just passive recipients of environmental influences. We're active participants in our own growth story. 